topic is characteristic towns and conservation of traditional villages. Relationship between revitalization of rural areas and of rural area and traditional uh, village conservations. The first one is um, oh yeah. This is the first case study I will present. But uh, I have four topics. The first one is uh, rural heritage. The second one is um, the Hongga honey terraced rural landscape in Yunnan province in China. The third one is the Coronian spit in Lithuania. And the fourth one is about villages in Transylvania, uh, Romania. So I will speak about small towns, but also about villages. And um, I will try uh, to do it in 15 minutes. Now we have three o'clock. OK, uh, rural landscapes and all the tangible and intangible heritage of rural areas are vital to the heritage of humanity. They are living, continuing, dynamic, cultural, social, environmental, and economic systems that extend across the lands and waters of our planet. While they are continuing, they are also adaptive and reflect the thousands of years of human interactions with nature. As such, they are critical repositories of traditional and indigenous knowledge essential in an area of climate change. In specific historic periods, rural landscape may have transformed following the introduction of new agriculture practices as well as new technologies and facilities related to food and fiber production, storage and distribution and or new social, political, economic, environmental conditions. Over time, rural landscapes have been changed by factors, economy, society, and environment. Rural heritage refers to the tangible and intangible heritage of rural and peri-rural, peri-urban areas. Peri-rural, peri-urban areas form the landscape interface between town and city and country. So it's um, not only about um, towns, but also about cities. Um, David uh, explained it to me uh, what, um, about the, the words city and towns uh, in, in English. It means a little bit different uh, if you translate it to, um, uh, to French, because will means uh, towns and cities. But in, England, uh, in uh, English, it's different. As urban uh, transition zones, they host diverse and changing land uses that frequently clash, but can also complement one another. That is, they are multifunctional. Furthermore, rural landscapes constitute a rich and complex and, and ensemble of tangible, intangible, and living heritage which are co-produced co by human nature symbiosis underscored by geographical diversity and ecological bounty, they are enriched by human interactions through cultural practice, forms of shelter, and modes of livelihood. Rural heritage and sustainable development. Rural heritage is defined as geographic areas associated with a historic event, activity, or people exhibiting cultural and aesthetic values, rural culture values to people and community, and is important to the identity of people and places. Rural civil society, and especially rural local communities related to heritage properties, 
have become a fundamental actor in the identification, protection, and management of heritage. This implication of local communities has an impact, for example, in the identification of values attributing to heritage. Besides historic and artistic values, the social and communitarian significance of building sites and places, places. Civil society has also a primary role in the process of heritage management, especially when considering heritage as an instrument for sustainable development. Without active participation of rural communities and local population, it is not possible to define how to adapt those spaces to new requirements and to consider social changes without compromising or threatening heritage values. Second, the Hongahani terrestrial landscape in the Yunnan province in China, which is of course a world heritage site. The terrestrial cultural landscape is a special type of agricultural ecosystems that maintains the balance between man and nature. It is the result of particular local farming methods and associated practices derived through centuries of selection and refinement. These farming and associated practices, including the crop species, cultivation, cultivation methods, and the natural environment, have been cast into knowledge systems, folk beliefs, and customs, and passed down from one generation to another as cultural traditions. Protecting the terraced landscape, I will show them now, means not only retaining its physical form, but also safeguarding the traditional knowledge system that underpins the structure. The protection of terraced cultural landscape is faced with environmental threats, and in the context of globalization, social, cultural, and economic challenges, such as the introduction of modern tools and technology for agricultural production, may threaten a sustainable way of land use and the maintenance of the ecosystems. Changes in lifestyle may lead to the exodus of young people to the urban, uncontrolled tourism and unregulated infrastructural development may put pressure onto local ecosystems and adversely affect traditional culture. The traditional agricultural economy should be developed to improve the life of the local population. The income of the farmers has to be increased by facilitating the sales and by enhancing the added value of the agricultural products as well as attracting young people to return to their villages and farmland. Knowledge systems, folk beliefs, and customs have to be respected. Mechanisms for passing on intangible heritage should be established to enhance local communities' cultural activities. This is a... Um, um, a community that it's celebrating um, a festival and uh, is eating together in this village. And this is one of these terraces. And this is another one. And this is again one of these uh, rice terraces. And this is um, a water system, irrigated water. And um, Let's look on, on one of their um, houses. And, um, they have um, vegetables. Um, they want um, to have uh, vegetables growing and salad. Next one is a Coronian spit in Lithuania. Here is a view of um, a small town called Nida, um, which uh, has be, which was a part of Germany up to, until 1923 and then 
uh, became Lithuania. Uh, Koronian Spit in Lithuania is a cultural landscape with many, uh, with some uh, towns and uh, small villages, and it's a World Heritage Site um, in Lithuania. The most valuable elements and properties of the Koronian Spit's cultural landscape are its exceptional size and general spatial structure, which reflects peculiar coexistence of man and nature. Characteristic panoramas and silhouette of the Koronian Lagoon, elements of cultural heritage, including the remains of postal routes, trade settlements of the 10th to 11th century, traditional fishing villages and other archaeological heritage buried under the sand. The spatial structure of the old fishing villages which became resorts, six urban areas which are historical parts of Nida, uh, Juat Grante, Braila, Pervalka, and so on, and the architecture of these villages, old wooden houses, buildings of 19th century architecture, including lighthouses, ports, churches, schools, and villas. During the upcoming 10 years, the cultural landscape Koronian Spit should set an example as an internationally protected area in the Baltic Sea region, where the inherited historical residential environment and way of life is cherished. 25 urban areas in the Koronian Spit are recognized as cultural values and are protected for the public appreciation. Directions for the urban area development include the preservation of historically formed valuable urban structures and their elements, the accommodation, road and path systems, and or their elements, individual houses, residential, public, and agricultural buildings, as well as the adaptation for contemporary needs and the development of infrastructure, which would enable visitors and tourists to discover the Koronian spit and spend their leisure time in the areas, and which would help locals to preserve the historical residential environment and local way of life. The spatial entirety of the cultural landscape of the Koronian spit demonstrates items, properties, and formative processes the original historical purpose of the objects and distinctive sustainable land use relating to the peculiarity of the natural environment. It also demonstrates a unique spiritual connection between man and nature. The tourism industry is one of the traditional forms of local business in the Coronian Spit. It has a strong impact on the economic development of the area and territorial planning, architecture and social structure. The recreation and tourism sector, ecotourism and leisure are main priorities of the Koronian Spit. But it does not um, uh, tackle um, uh, mass uh, tourism, not now. And, um, but there is a, a problem of the Koronian Spit as a World Heritage Site. Um, because um, half of it belongs to Lithuania and half of it belongs now to uh, Russia because they took it from East, uh, it was East Prussia and they, they took it from Germany, uh, Germany after the World War num number two. And uh, the last one, villages in, um, but I, I will show you some, uh, Some images of the um, uh, cultural landscape of the Koronian Spit. At first, it was uh, the town Nida, and this is again um, uh, the town of Nida with these fisher ho fishermen houses and um, other houses, and um, this is. Um, uh, also a house uh, in this um, town. The last one, uh, the last topic is the villages in Transylvania, Romania. Mm -hmm. I have, um, it's 15 minutes now, so I have only, let's say, three or four minutes. 
Transylvanian Highlands reveal a scenery as varied as its um, beautiful slopes, fortified churches and villages, food made with local ingredients, artisans and craftsmen and folk traditions. Local communities maintain the mosaic landscape with well-managed villages, living mainly from selling local products and services created through the sustainable use of natural resources and of cultural values. For the villages that are struggling to keep their spirit in the world of modernism, ecotourism and cultural tourism can be engine for of development. It can also bring additional sources of income for the local. In Transylvania, many villages like Altina and Alma V were founded by Saxons in the 13th century. The present day village of Alma V, with its citadel, orchards, and vineyards, is located at the end of a country road nestled between forest strewn hills. The scenery, together with the fortified church and the rustic houses, form a picturesque view. But the most valuable treasure of Alma V is the people. A varied yet harmonious community of ethnicities and personalities who live together preserving authentic rural customs. Even um, uh, the, um, villagers, uh, the um, villagers have left uh, between uh, World War No. 2 and now because they were uh, German Saxons and they went uh, back uh, to Germany. But uh, now the villagers are still um, really uh, very good for this um, community. This project of Alma V has restored old building forms, repaired in ancient wooden bridges and paved the public roads with river rock. The village store has been remodeled to accommodate a traditional rustic wine cellar. Uh, Alma V came into being in the year 1289. It was a free village under the Hungarian crown. Uh, two centuries later, a church was built overseeing and protecting the entire village. Once famous for its vineyards and orchards, the village of Alma V became depopulated during the Saxon exodus of the 1990s. Presently, there are 200 households in Alma V with 390 inhabitants in total. Each house is painted in a distinct color, as you see, and each facade is decorated with a family seal, along with a date and a saying which refers to an important event in the building's history. The pathways to the houses have wooden carved bridges, adding to the idyllic scenery. Uh, in the last 10 years, several facades of private houses were renovated. The local shop and the local medical proactive uh, practice were consolida uh, consolidated. In April 2015, a major revitalization project along with a functional conversion of the fortification focusing on the fortified walls and towers has been started. The interior parts of the fortified wall were also restored and transformed into a local center able to host special events, community celebrations. Visitors have the opportunity to buy crafted local objects and try the traditional food, both created and prepared by members of the community. One of the main objectives was to generate a sustainable economic, economic uh, development and strengthen the community that would continue striving after the project is over. Therefore, frequent meetings with representatives of the 400 inhabitants were organized. The purpose was to strengthen the social cohesion and motivate people to work together in improving their current quality of life while keeping their traditional lifestyle. Thank you very much. But some, um, this is a rural landscape with these uh, colored houses. And this is uh, um, another street. And that, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank Five you. minutes more. Thank you, President. <laughs> we shall continue. I think uh, Connor is not here. No, he's not here. He's not here, uh, for sure. Huh? That's, that's, that's why I was. Uh, okay. Speaking. 
so we can proceed with uh, our um, very good friend and honorary member of uh, CIVIC, Teresa Coletta, uh, on uh, the researches and the projects to preserve the exceptional Mediterranean historic and cultural landscape of the rural terraces and the small Edna. towns and villages of Costiera Malfitana in the south of Italy, close to Naples. <laughs> Teresa. Uh. Presentation, please. Uh, to the landscape heritage of the terras. This is a rural historical landscape and a small historical town and villages in Italian languages, Borghi. Terras and the villages are the peculiar and the unique elements of the Amalfi Coast landscape. Their existence allowed this site to be recognized as a world heritage by UNESCO in 1997. The principal point, I don't know if I have uh, this uh, presentation in uh, 15 minutes, but the point is uh, uh, the landscape heritage of Terras and the rural historical landscape, the Terras. This is the spirit of the place of Genus Loci of Costiera Malfitana. Traditional human settlement, small historical town, and the terras are the peculiar and unique elements of the Amalfi Coast. Amalfi Coast is in the criteria in the UNESCO list for the criteria 2, 4, 5. The terras and the traditional human settlement heritage preservation is the safeguard of genus loci of these ambience. The abandonment and the loss of the inhabitants and from the mass tourism pressure make the transformation of the small farm in a new use. The research and the project to preserve this exceptional Mediterranean historical cultural landscape of the terras and the rehabilitation of the historical village is the theme of the management plan of Amalfitana Coast in 2007. Point one, traditional man settlement and for the criteria, this is the, the small village. The Amalfi Coast, this is the convention, and this is considered in the description, the justification, is an outstanding example of a Mediterranean landscape with exceptional cultural and natural scenic value, resulting from its dramatic topography and historical evolution occurred by the community, a brilliant example of a clever use of a resource. This is uh, the localization of the people that don't know Amalfitana Coast is uh, in the south out of Italy is uh, the Gulf of Salerno and uh, is a very old Ducato di Amalfi. This is the uh, landscape of the Costiera, is an outstanding example uh, and the dramatic topography and historical evolution. Le there are uh, 15 municipalities in the province of Salerno and the southern slope of the peninsula formed by the Mount uh, Lattari Hills, uh, stretching from the Picentini, and uh, there is a very famous uh, historic town, Amalfi, Atrani, Regina Maior, Regina Minor, and the summer minor one, this is Positano, Praiano, Chatara, Ercle, with the mountain village. Scala, Tramonti, Pontone, Ravello, Conca and Furore. There is an immense diversity of landscape, ranging from the coastal settlement to the intensively cultivated slower slope and the large area of open pastoral land to the dramatic high mountains. This is the perimeter of the site UNESCO. This is a very big property. This is a, uh, Undicimere thousand in green color. This is a very big territory, and uh, uh, the peculiarity of UNESCO Amalfi Coast as a historical cultural landscape. The outstanding universal value of Costiera does not derive from what it was, but from how man adapted it. 
Cultural landscape and particularly the one of the costiera are the result of continuing transformation, always with the objective of obtaining advantage. There is a farmer in the uh, 11th century realized that the Rust Garden did it to gain farmable land, but always compatible and characterized by a clever exploitation of local resources. The Amalfi Coast is an area of critical physical beauty and the natural diversity. La, the versatility of the inhabitants in adapting the use of the land to diverse nature of the terrain. This is a characteristic of the inhabitants. This is the variety, uh, the variety of the exceptional natural and the cultural landscape of the Amalfi Coast. There is a great variety. This is uh, the um, uh, sea, similar to Amalfi, the sea town with harbor uh, in the Gulf. There is a mountain, and this is the terrace. Uh, this is the argument that I would like to stress. The terrace and the traditional human settlement heritage, preservation, and the particular effort to safeguard this genius logic. This is a two different uh, position for uh, this uh, to preserve. The abandonment and the loss of the inhabitants and from the mass tourism pursuit with the transformation of the small farmers in a new use. This is a two uh, type of uh, historical rural landscape in Amalfi Coast. Uh, this is the traditional human settlement in the mountain. This is the historical village Scala, you see in this water. This is the historical Slopen towns, Scala, near Ravello, the more ancient small historical town of Costiera Maspitana in the 400 meters on the sea level. I will know the uh, history of the transformation of the slope in terras and the bed of the rural landscape. The rule have permitted to continue the agricultural activity until today. This is the characteristic of this. And this is when I say the terras. The terras is a money or to, to preserve and to give the possibility to have the agriculture in this coast. This is very, very uh, difficult to have this uh, uh, product in this particular landscape. The terracing system of Amalfitana coast, this is by the city of Web Ipogea, make the, our president of ICOMOS Italy, Pietro Laureano. And this is in the, in the left, uh, in the right side, the possibility to have the, pos uh, the preserve the water, the muria secco in Italian language, this is the, the stone to preserve and to make the terras. This is in the, in the last picture, it's possible to see the, the system of the water and the system to have the plain in the different type of the quote. Uh, the ancient organization of the terras began in the medieval period. I go, these terras are a peculiar and unique element of the Amalfi Coast. Terras are the most brilliant invention ever made in the coast because this technique stabilizes the slopes, preventing landslide, a self-regulated system absolutely integrated with the landscape. The real protagonist of the Amalfi Coast, thanks to its innovative organization of the space since the medieval period. The terrace today, this is the problem to the southward because there is the loss of inhabitants, the very uh, difficult uh, the, the population, and the consequent the absence of the cultivation caused the downgrade of the street and the stair. Uh, this is the periodic, uh, do you know, the UNESCO make the periodic uh, cycle of uh, uh, report about the protection, management, monitoring of the World Heritage Center. And uh, the, in this um, report of 2014, the reason uh, is the progressive of the population of many inhabitants. And uh, stress the report to need to be solved with a solution which have already been started by go local governance. It's very known that the new vision of the landscape from the monuments of the, to the people, the, the new landscape convention, this is the 2000, and uh, this is a very important uh, international uh, uh, Congress that you have two years ago uh, about the culture of the terrace for the safeguard of the landscape in the new culture years 2000. 
this um, is a thematic uh, now international because it's uh, the terrace preservation and valorization that is not only in the Costiera Amalfitana, but in many, many other parts in the world. And uh, this uh, uh, working activity modify the territory and modify the landscape. This is to preserve this particular landscape is necessary. Uh, uh, this is uh, the project about the costiera, uh, the research and the project to preserve the exceptional Mediterranean historical cultural landscape. And uh, the, in two, two things I will find for you, the management plan and the rehabilitation project through the realized in the year 2014-2018. Uh, I, uh, this is the management plan of the Costiera. This is uh, uh, realized in the 2007. And uh, the optical is uh, two words the ancient coast, restoration and the valorization of the rule that produced the cultural landscape of the Amalfitana coast in the isola. For a new tourism, that is the hold. This is possible to read uh, this plan in the portal website UNESCO Amalfitana Coast.it. The program of uh, management plan of the Costiera is a tourism of a culture on the basis of a sustainable of UNESCO site. This intervention aims at the city's sustainable development, the improvement of the quality of life, as well as the highlighting of all the elements composing its character, its value, and the quality of the ensuring ensemble. Uh, also, is um, uh, very important is a strategic structure of support this program is uh, uh, the local governance and the superintendence. And this is uh, all the, um, the line of the tourism of quality promoted by the management plan. I will speak about only three. This is in red color. Uh, the rehabilitation and the promotion of uh, ancient pedestrian itinerary, the rural district and the, the traditional ancient craft. The other is possible to read in the portale. Uh, the three interventions that I have chosen is the rehabilitation and valorization of ancient street, Ravello Terras as pilot project in the rural district and the Museo of the Handmade Paper. Uh, the territory and the historical settlement, this is the first uh, objective uh, today realized. The network of the route is strictly related to the morphology of the territory that had a particular configuration before the construction of the coastal street at the end of, this is an error, uh, 19th century. The network of the route before the 19th, uh, 19th century connect all the settlements, small cities, villages, houses, farms by the principal route, totally flat, realized in continuity of the level band, the original street, and a second itinerary with stair, connected with the original and the private property with their terrace of pertinence and the rural building closed into a perimeter by a wall, two meters height. The intervention of the ancient route of historical slope town as a research about the historical route, the relationship with the urban and rural landscape. All historical roads were, were, uh, were in a high ground to connect the small historical town and village in the mountain with the Amalfi port city since the Roman period until the 18th century. Uh, 19, uh, 19th century. The safeguard of the historical viability recognized as a value of the cultural heritage is today realized. This is the, the, uh, the photo. Can you see the, uh, the pedestrian itinerary from the small center? And this is uh, now the possibility, if you arrive in the coastal of Amalfi, to make by foot this pedestrian itinerary. This is a map that is uh, common to give. Many people arrive for this pedestrian itinerary. This is the ancient street, the only connection between the small center along the hills in the height of the coast. It's very interesting. Uh, this is uh, the um, itinerary by the tourism in the Amalfi Coast. Uh, and the valorization of the walking path and the pedestrian itinerary and the renovation of the exceptional walking path of the Strada Maestra dei Villaggi. This is uh, the biggest street in the top 
of Amalfi uh, coast and uh, connect Amalfi to Conca dei Marini and the Furore. Now restore uh, to move in security. This is uh, an itinerary very interesting to make. Uh, the second intervention of the management plan of uh, uh, Costa Amalfitana is the terrace uh, of a pilot project in the law of a rural district for the regeneration of the agricultural system. This is uh, to f f this uh, rural district is important because uh, is uh, to obtain a brand of a territorial productive zone. Uh, the, in Italian language, is marchio de area territoriale to preserve the excellent product of this area for an innovative tourism, tourism and agriculture. This is a new model of management where the public and the private enterprises work all together to obtain a local development with more participation of the inhabitants on the base of the European program 2014-2020. Principal is the lemon. The lemon is a very uh, brand in the Costa Malfitana. This is uh, il, fusa, il fuso dei limoni. This is uh, the, the last uh, important uh, uh, action the management plan of Costa is a best practice, the rehabilitation of the Amalfitana ancient activity of the system of the canals and the feeding towers of water, the historical paper manufacture and the valorization with an innovative idea, the paper mill museum, museum of the handmade paper the valorization of the historical paper manufacture and the work of the master in Ars Cartarum with the system of the canals and the feeding towers of water with an innovative idea, Museum of the Handmade. The, the birth of the innovative idea began in 1971 by the Cartaro Nicola Milano. Today, the museum is a concrete reality with many visitors and it is realized the object for the historical heritage conservation and the renovation of a very ancient art craft as the production of the handmade paper. A Matruda production is one of the best. Our visit at the paper mill is possible to see this in the uh, portale of Amalfi Coast. Uh, it's now action. Uh, principal point of the photo action, uh, coordinate the activity to give more value to the terrace landscape, software, and the more people's participation, especially the inhabitants of the village. Second, implement the management system plan with an annual work action to explain to the inhabitants of the, all the municipality of the area UNESCO. Third, valorization will be better if all parties cooperate for an organization responsible strategic structure of management. So, intendance for architectural heritage, but also Comunità Montana of Monti Lattari, Regional Park of Monti Lattari, and also Quebec is the Ravello European uh, activity in Ravello. Thanks for your attention. Many thanks, Teresa. Um, we have noticed that um, uh, Italy has a very um, very much experience on this uh, management, special management of uh, um, cultural landscapes uh, in terraces such as uh, Cinque Terre and so on. Um, this uh, is an exemplary uh, presentation for us. Thank you very much. So now we are going to the debate of this part. Klaus Peter, can to be with us, please? First, um, uh, there are some questions, please. Some questions? Uh, there are some comments? Someone who likes to, to report something on this uh, very interesting topic? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Teresa no, likes uh, to, to comment. What is uh, I, for to give uh, this information, I don't speak about the new law in Italian now for the Borghi. Uh, I speak about this uh, with uh, 
uh, Elena, but it's important for our uh, nationality to have this uh, new law about Borghi. Uh, I have uh, here uh, the other uh, slide, but I have also the law. This law is particular uh, for, uh, to, have, to give money to the Italian small village, small uh, towns that is in the hill, not uh, near the uh, near the sea, and uh, there is uh, to uh, make uh, the possibility to have uh, the rebuilding of the emergence of this uh, small uh, town. Uh, also, the police uh, is uh, comprised in this uh, possibility to make the restoration not only of the church, but also for the house, for the private people, for the market people, and also very important to have the internet in this little borg. A particular financement to connect this borg around a region. This is a new law, and we, I think this is more important for the population of this small town there is in the hill. It is now not uh, inserted in the tourism. With uh, this, this new financement, it's possible to insert these towns in the uh, itinerary of uh, our region in the hill. Not only the tourism by the sea, near the sea, but also a tourism in a small village, also the restore by hotel, bed and breakfast, but not uh, completely uh, mass tourism in this uh, little burg, but is the, to give an, an aid to have the, the population to stay in this burg, to have a new activity, and to have a new activity, the connection with the other burg. I have with me the law, but it's in Italian language. Thanks, uh, Teresa. Yes, um, from Elena, and after. <laughs> it's, very it's very interesting, um, this law. Um, I have a year in Italian language. It's a big problem. Um, villages that are empty or, with, or the, they are depopulated. Uh, who finances uh, the restoration of these buildings? I didn't understand. Who makes the finance? And are this the owners involved in the program? What about the owners and who finances? <laughs> Finance the government, the Italian government, this law. Uh, okay. And this, the request is uh, Borg, uh, the Borghi uh, municipality, Borghi municipality, no village, uh, only uh, three houses, no. There is the municipality uh, of uh, near the hill. I bring the law, and, uh, the, and uh, this is uh, the finance to. Uh, to give the money to this municipality to make the safeguard and to promote the new uh, activity in this burg to contest the depopulation of this uh, little uh, small town. As far Paolo. as I understand, this is the regional law of the Regione Campania, and in Italy it is a planning that is piano territoriale regionale. The regional plans, they are managing European funds. So it's European uh, money that is going to the Italian government who is passing to the regions and is going locally. So it's a type of law that could be applied in all the other European countries because the model is following the European rules. And this is very important. Not only, it, it not is, only, it not is, only, on, uh, not, it's not only European funds. Oh no, not it's, it's not only, but it's important not only. that you have public funds and then the private are joining. This is an innovative law that the region where Coleta is saying Campania has been introduced not long time ago. And By saying all the Italy, eh? all the, Italy. the, the all name Italy. of this uh, law is uh, Salva Borghi. This Salva is in Italian yes. language. Yes. To safeguard, to yes. go. I think it is possible that the financement uh, is uh, really concrete. This is the very uh, reality about this. Because the law is uh, perfect, it's approved, this uh, law, but. Uh, is not uh, now uh, in act, in action, in action. Implementation. There's no 
to the implementation because in Italy we have a change of a political uh, situation. Our and vice, we hope. Our we vice hope. president, uh, David Logan from Australia, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Klaus Peter. Um, the towns and villages that you mentioned were uh, implementing some form of historic urban landscape approach. Is that similar to UNESCO's um, approach? Exactly. Um, uh, I, I did not mention that um, uh, the Hungi, uh, honey terraces and all the Kronian spit um, um, are World Heritage Sites and they both uh, they have management plans. And so, of course, uh, they are, um, uh, there's a revision of these plans and uh, uh, also uh, proactive uh, monitoring. So uh, the people um, from um, UNESCO um, come to these places and revise them. Um, it's not uh, with this, uh, but it's also in, um, in this um, Siebenbürgen uh, County um, in um, Romania. Uh, some villages are also World Heritage, but uh, I'd like to mention that uh, these villages are also um, helped by uh, the Prince Charles uh, uh, Trust. He's really interested in this and uh, Yes, but there are um, uh, um, UNESCO rules. Samir, our vice president from uh, France. Yes, uh, my question is to Teresa. Uh, Italy has many wonders, many uh, beautiful landscapes and two of them particularly are on the World Heritage List, uh, the Cinque Terre and the Amalfi coastline. And they have both similar features. Yes, the Congress know, uh, is uh, old uh, in the world, but particularly in Italy. Also mm. in Padova, in Verona, in the Cinque Terre, in Liguria, also mm. in Campania. So this, is, this was my question. What is the originality of the Amalfitana coast in regard with other uh, projects, with other sites in Italy? Amalfitana coast because it's very, very ancient. This is the first. This is a medieval situation in Amalfitana coast because uh, it is, uh, the bird of Amalfi is in a height period height medieval period. This is a very ancient, this uh, uh, ma manner of uh, uh, to make the cultivation in this particular territory. This is a, a very long experience about the inhabitants to have the possibility to have the agriculture, to have the sustainability for uh, this activity. And uh, this, the loss of the inhabitants now, because not every people like to uh, stay in these uh, terras, and uh, the loss is a, a, a bad situation of uh, these terras because if do not uh, have the, um, the safeguard of these terras, they completely uh, with the water, with the no situation of the systemation to organize these terras. This is a very difficult to have uh, this agriculture in this slope uh, town. This is difficult to live in this slope town because only by, by pedestrian, it's not possible to have the, the, the, um, the car. There are no bus, no uh, anything about this. And the same is in this small uh, agricultural farm. There is no possibility to have uh, the transport. Only the transport is uh, by uh, animals and uh, pedestrian. This is uh, very difficult for us uh, to uh, safeguard this. And uh, this is a, a new, um, a, this is a new, the, the new law about the rural landscape 
And uh, this is a particular of the Italian territory because the, I, I show you this international uh, congress that you made in the itinerary organized by Pietro Laureano, our president of Vicomos Italy, but it's not only in Campania region, but also in Cinque Terre, it's in Padova, Verona, and Venice. All the, this problem is important to have this. Uh, there is now a book about this, uh, the, uh, to suffer the terras. The terras is a, a, problem, a thematic of uh, our land, rural landscape. In uh, Costiera Malfitana is particular because there is the product, the lemon and the olive, but it's not similar the same product in, uh, uh, in Liguria or in uh, Padova. But the important is the manner of to produce this is to have the terras. The terras is uh, now similar in every part of, so in Ischia we have uh, the island near the Italian Gulf, Ischia, we have a, a part of the island with terras. This is, I think, is a new thematic, the terras, but it's uh, not only in Italy, because this international congress present many, many, um, art, I don't remember, but many other people present the terras. The terras is, a, a, um, I think, is important to preserve because it's a very old manner to produce in uh, the region, particular with a particular topography in the, in the, to cultivate, not in plain, but in the, in the hill. It's particular. It's a thematic. I think it's a rural no, landscape is a new thematic. It's, okay. it's uh, after 2000. Uh, the landscape is uh, the, la legge sul paesaggio is uh, 2000. After this, the rural landscape is uh, now is a thematic very important to preserve this uh, particular landscape, the terras. Thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, we have to notice that um, the, the scientific symposium in Morocco, FICOMUS, uh, the last days was dedicated to um, uh, agricultural uh, uh, cultural landscape. And uh, the matter of uh, terras of terrace is very important, very particularly uh, in the surrounding of Mediterranean. And um, um, the, uh, the policy on terraces in Italy are a very good example and very good, um, um, how can I say, way to go on. Because uh, everywhere in uh, surrounding of uh, Mediterranean have terraces. And uh, speaking about the climate and uh, the, the measure that uh, Alvaro uh, mentioned this morning uh, to, to have uh, some um, preventions about uh, the dangers uh, provo provoking by the climate change. Terraces is the traditional uh, way to preserve the agricultural landscape and to save, save the land. Um, yeah, uh, Klaus Peter likes to, to, say, to say something. Thank uh, you. Uh, yes, I would After like that, we are going for uh, uh, post cafe. Post cafe, to the okay. <laughs> um, I would like to mention uh, that uh, there are really um, important uh, terraces in China. I spoke about the um, Hongge Hange rice terraces, and uh, there are also um, uh, terraces on the World Heritage List in Philippines. Yes. So these are. In China, I know. Yeah, rice terrace. But yeah. now the proposal to present uh, to UNESCO World Heritage is Murasecco. It's a new proposal. To, in the Mediterranean area, we have uh, this uh, traditional activity to build the, the stone without Malta, Malta to make the concrete. This is a new proposal, began from Italy. Uh, Murasecco is in Italian language, it's very famous in Spain. Spain, but also in Greece. Rural? Uh, Muro a secco is a particular make to the stone uh, without uh, concrete. This is a, a particular uh, methodology to have uh, the, uh, also on the terrace, to have the, the, separ the separation uh, into the pro different property, but also to have the, uh, to have the terrace with uh, 
different level. And uh, the mo uh, this, in every part of the world, the stone is different, but the methodology to make without uh, Malta is the same. Uh, in Italian language, mura secco secco is without uh, water. Okay. With uh, only by sto uh, with so this, this is, is a um, new proposal for UNESCO traditional no, activity no, no. to put in the World Heritage List. Teresa, it's already done. It is already done and accepted uh, by UNESCO ah, in 2018. It is um, uh, included in the immaterial list of yes, UNESCO last, is the last year. And uh, it was a proposal that uh, came from uh, several countries uh, in, um, around the Mediterranean, France, Spain, Italy, Greece, uh, Croatia, this is and I don't remember all the cases. Okay. Okay, this is okay. important because it's l'arte del muro a secco, similar to pizza. It's l'arte della pizza che è entrata nel patrimonio del mondo, non la pizza. <laughs> this is important to stress. Eh? Okay, we are going for post cafe. How long? Eh? How long? Here. How long? Uh, how long, Faiga? F Fifteen minutes? Twenty? Uh, on continue? On uh, excuse me, Faiga proposes to continue uh, really, in the next, really, really. Uh, the next okay. topic. And uh, we are going for the post-cafe a little later. Okay. Yes. Okay. Slides show uh, three important books about this. Um, the first one is the Historic Urban Landscape, Managing Heritage in an Urban Century. It, is, um, it was written by Francesco Brandarin, who was a um, very important person of UNESCO and Ron von Earth, who died one year ago. The second one is from Anna Pereira Rodas and also from Francesco Brandarin. Um, it's called Reshaping Urban Conservation, the Historic Urban Landscape Approach in Action. Shh. The second one is the um, HUL Guidebook um, the HUL guidebook, Managing Heritage is Dynamic and Constantly Changing Urban Environments. The historic urban landscape was adop adopted by the 36th session of the UNESCO General Conference in 2011. It's called the UNESCO Recommendation on the Historic Urban Landscape. It's here, um, uh, I'm showing you in the slide here, UNESCO. The Hull recommendation is an approach. Um, the Hull recommendation is an approach or tool and process for assisting in the management of cultural urban heritage and it's not a category of place, that's very important. Some aspects of the HUL tool. First, assess natural, cultural, and human resources. Secondly, engage the community and stakeholders consultations, cultural mapping. Thirdly, determine vulnerability of urban heritage to socioeconomic pressures. Fourthly, integrate urban heritage values and their vulnerability concerns into citywide plan and regulations framework. Fifth, prioritize policies and actions for conservation and development. Who is always speaking? Establish the appropriate partnership and local management frameworks. And seventh, coordinates the activities among different actors. Changes of the urbanizations and necessary cooperation. Urbanization nowadays is leading to irreversible socioeconomic changes and cooperation between all parties involved. At different levels, it is required to achieve a comprehensive quality of living environment. It's better outside. 
Um, here is a, um, uh, an image of Florence. The high recommendation as an approach is an approach or tool and process for assisting in the management of cultural urban heritage and not a category of place. Questions. How does the Hull approach respond to urgent contacts on climate change, population explosion and better living standards for citizens? And does it examine the importance and benefits of appropriately integrating conservation, management and planning strategies of historic urban areas into local development processes? Revision of Hull. Hull has to be reviewed and their practical implementation updated, especially regarding the integration of modern architecture into a historical environment like you see here. There has been a WITRAP meeting in Shanghai in March 2018, which had been convened to discuss the ongoing implementation of the Hull recommendation. Shanghai. ICOMOS and Australian HUL Focal Point Group member Elizabeth Vines recently attended a planning meeting in Fukuoka, Japan on the 28th and 29th of May in 2019 to discuss a possible experts meeting on HUL proposed for January 2020 also in Fukuoka in Japan and this is uh, also our president um, Toshi Kono, he is one of the um, organizers. The objective of the Japan meeting was to follow on f uh, fr uh, from the findings of the UNESCO survey of member states. The upcoming UNESCO general conference in November 2019 in two weeks, um, three weeks, proposes ongoing support for the Hull recommendation and encourages adoption by more member states. See the link. HUL and SDGs. The SDGs and Urban Agenda are the urgent frameworks in which to consider Hull, as well as UNESCO's ongoing commitment to Hull as confirmed in the recommendation for the upcoming November UNESCO General Conference. Here you see the 17 uh, SDG goals. Importance of HAL for urban agendas and SDGs. The urban agenda and SDGs provide a framework of great urgency to ensure that the global community strengthens efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage. You all know about um, goal 11.4 of the SDGs. This 2030 time frame emphasizes the importance of the Hull approach, particularly in areas where urban conservation is not occurring or being managed well. A key value of the Hull approach is its flexibility and that it can integrate a wide, a wide range of attributes values, so like on the image. Hull as holistic approach. The Hull approach allows a dynamic and holistic approach with potential for flexibility in the management of positive transformation of a place. And now about the findings of the Hull survey. One of the findings of the survey is conclusion 77. The Hull recommendation is relevant as cities and their heritage continue to face a number of complex global challenges and seek sustainability, inclusion, and resilience. The Hull approach is a tool to manage change in historic urban areas facing current global challenges. And all historic urban areas are facing current global challenges. Another finding of the survey is conclusion 78. The data shows that there has been some progress made in implementing key concepts of the recommendation, yet much remains to be done. In implementation of the Hull approach, it is crucial to establish links 
between natural, national, national, federal and local level, decision makers at the country level. So in the survey, they, um, um, there were um, results that uh, it's important for the local level, but not about the links between national, federal and the local level. Another finding of the survey is conclusion 91. Educational programs are limited for young professionals, therefore capacity building is necessary across regions and between diverse stakeholders, including local authorities and communities. Better harnessing of digital technologies concerning urban heritage to reach out to youth should be examined. Uh, only one. Another finding of the survey is conclusion 92. The participation of local communities is reported to be limited. Therefore, more tools and methodologies are necessary for the systematic engagement of local communities in decision-making processes. Thank you for your attention. I am showing you the Olympic Stadium um, which is uh, one of the topics, uh, one um, Germany wants to um, put it on the World Heritage List. Thank you very much. Many, many thanks, uh, Klaus Peter. David Logan, please. David Logan on uh, relationship between revitalization of rural areas and traditional village conservation. Oh, oh, no, excuse me. The, the HAL approach, success factors for planning frameworks. Excuse yeah. me, because the program is uh, written uh, in a very special way. Mm -hmm. I was confused. We have some <laughs> Excuse me. David? Yeah, I just have to okay. get some technical okay. the um, implementation of Hull um, by administrations. Um, and Alvaro also referred to um, whether that can actually be done. You know, is it possible to implement Hull um, in a way that protects historic cities? And if so, how do we do it? Um, UNESCO's um, approach, the, the Hull approach, um, is clear in the six steps that should be taken, but it is not clear as to what those six steps actually mean. And I want to talk today about um, the way that Georgetown in Malaysia, a World Heritage City, has implemented um, the Hull approach in their planning instruments. And I think they've done it very successfully, so I wanted to talk about that. So these are the six steps, or, or very close to the six steps that um, Klaus Peter showed a moment ago. These are, this is a slight variation as summarised by an Australian colleague of mine, um, which shows um, one by one the way that um, a government or an agency, such as a, a local administration, might implement um, Hull. Um, the first of the steps, I'm going to talk about each of those in slightly more detail. Um, the first of the steps is to understand the significance of the place um, before um, making decisions um, about it. But before I do that, I just think I, I will um, just make a few statements about the Hull approach. Um, it recognises that change in historic cities is inevitable. Um, and that concept is embraced by both UNESCO in its papers number 27, but also in the Valletta principles prepared by CIVI. So change is inevitable in historic cities. Um, the Hull approach is based on a, an holistic approach um, of all aspects of heritage and in particular community values. 
both tangible and intangible. Um, and that's also consistent with one of the key philosophies behind the Valletta Principles, which state historic towns and urban areas, as well as their settings, must be considered in their totality. So in other words, the whole thing needs to be considered. Cultural tra traditions and practices of the different communities which make up a city, along with traditional trades, crafts, festivals, dance, costumes, music, food and daily life are all important parts of that key totality. The Hull approach advocates integration of heritage management with urban planning and development processes. The question though is, how should that be done? And what does that mean, this, this concept of integration into city processes? Um, and that's where um, UNESCO has sought ICOMOS's advice and uh, established the focal point group, which um, Klaus Peter mentioned, which is um, Liz Vines, um, an Australian member, has led. I've also been providing some advice to that um, group. But to date, not a lot has happened, I have to say, partly because UNESCO has not made clear what advice it would like from ICOMOS. So, and, and I think it's an opportunity for CIVI as a, as a group to actually now embrace Hull and to consider, as Alvaro already mentioned, um, amending the Valletta principles to embrace um, some of these concepts and the concepts of climate change, which are also part of the Hull um, approach as well. And as Klaus Peter mentioned, Hull um, is not a class of heritage, it is an approach. Um, and that's the way that UNESCO have perceived it, so that we don't talk about a hull, but we talk about the approach um, within the six steps. So the first step um, that um, is advocated is to understand the significance of the place, or all of the values of the place. And I want to um, just explain what some of those values may be, and this is the definition um, that exists. So while Hull, as I mentioned a moment ago, is not a thing. It is nevertheless defined. So it's defined as, and um, we already saw this from Elena, um, the urban landscape um, and a, an urban area extending beyond the notion of historic centres or ensembles to include the broader urban context and its geographical setting. So the wider setting, which is also part of the approach, includes the topography, the geomorphology, the hydrology and natural features, its built environment, both historic and contemporary, its infrastructures above and below ground, so that includes archaeology, its open spaces and gardens, and someone here today already mentioned that perhaps we don't consider gardens enough, but certainly the Hull approach does consider gardens and landscape. Um, land use patterns, spatial organisation, perceptions and visual relationships, as well as other elements of the urban structure. Now importantly, it also includes the social and cultural practices and values, economic processes and the intangible dimensions of heritage. We can't um, protect heritage in cities unless we consider the socio-economic considerations and, and the impacts, potential impacts on social socioeconomic um, aspects from development. We must consider those things. So one tool for considering um, community value that is widely used throughout Asia is cultural mapping. Um, and uh, there are various um, cultural mapping tool, tools available. I think this is a particularly good one, um, written by a woman who lives in Malaysia. And again, she talks about the integration of planning and uh, it needs to be integrated into all economic, social and environmental aspects of a city. Um, just dealing quickly with the urban morphology. So now I'll talk about Georgetown, which was World Heritage listed in 2008. And um, soon after that adopted, not immediately, but soon after, adopted a Hull approach in its planning um, approach and its um, conservation policies for the city. 
And um, after a while, not immediately, it recognises the, recognise the importance of the urban morphology, um, including the topographical background, the hills that you see behind the city, not just the city itself. The hills are some distance away from the city, but nevertheless are an important part of um, the values of that city. And, and the people in Georgetown also value um, the approach. So you can imagine that if development was proposed that would block the, uh, obscure the views of the hills from the water, that might have an impact on the city. Now, in order to protect those values, we need to identify them. We need to actually state what they are and to, to recognise them as being important. So that's what the planning instrument does. And there you have a closer view of the hills and you can't quite see it in the, the um, drawing on the left, but the same hills exist in that photo. Um, and of course, spiritual values and cultural practices are recognised and all of these things can be mapped and are mapped. Uh, again, social practices, cultural practices, and townscape values, and then all the individual buildings um, that make up the place and their relative importance can be mapped in order to um, protect it and integrate those values. But as I mentioned before, buildings are just one aspect of the historic urban landscape approach. You also have things such as the traditional trades, so the the songcock maker, the hat maker, the traditional hats, and the, um, the tombstone engraver, you know, a very important um, traditional trade that is endangered um, in Georgetown. And Georgetown, by the way, is on the island of Penang, which is a state of Malaysia. Um, even things such as festival routes um, that are important to the individual um, socio-cultural groups are mapped and identified, and performance spaces, because all of these things are an important part of that, of that cultural landscape. And even things such as food, traditional food and recipes, are valued by the communities um, in Malaysia. When I was there, and I've been there several times, um, they keep telling me how important food is to them um, and the traditional foods, and they're very proud of the food that they, that they have as well. Um, and things such as, um, because food is important, then therefore the restaurants and food stalls are um, important to the place and need to be mapped in order that they can be recognised and protected. Um, so step two is once the values have been identified, then um, conservation policies can be prepared for the city. So a management plan, in the case of Georgetown, they prepared a conservation management plan in 2011 three years after the listing. There was an earlier draft, but um, this is the 2011 plan. There is a later draft now as well. And they also prepared a, um, a special area plan, which provided more detail than the conservation management plan. So the conservation management plan, or CMP, provided the broader policies um, for the place. And that was prepared following extensive community consultation. And that, as I mentioned before, is a key aspect of the Hull approach in each, each step or each stage. Uh, and then they stated in the conservation management plan that they wanted to follow an historic urban landscape approach um, in the city. And that's what they would do to identify and protect both the intangible and the tangible values, in, in particular the intangible living culture, which was um, seen as very important by the community. So the uh, socio-cultural topography was identified. Um, and again, these things can all be mapped in planning instruments. So policy documents first, but eventually in planning instruments. And things such as views into and out of the city and um, landmarks, again, can be mapped, identified and mapped. And the importance of the traditional trades and crafts has long been identified uh, and recognised in Georgetown. And um, this is one of those. And um, this is a, a man who makes the joysticks for the um, Chinese temples, a very important part of the cultural practices. And yet, you can imagine that um, if ram rampant development were to occur, um, the consequence is usually of, of large development that um, land prices go up. And when land prices go up, traditional trades and crafts are often forced out of historic cities. So 
they've taken steps to identify that. And um, certainly when I was assessing recently a proposal for a, a light rail system, which is very good for the city because it uh, potentially uh, reduces car use in the city, um, one of the things that um, occurred to me was that um, such a, a, a new transport system might well have an impact on the traditional trades and crafts. And I recommended, um, as part of the ECOMOS recommendation um, to UNESCO, that some consideration be given to that and possibly for subsidies um, to be given to those trades and crafts which they would like to see retained in the historic town in the face of rising land prices and, and urban development. And as Alvara mentioned, the realities of climate change, um, inund tidal inundation, flooding, are all important things that need to be identified and um, once they're identified, they can then be protected. And certainly the Hull approach advocates that. The third step is robust and include, uh, inclusive strategic planning that integrates all aspects of environmental planning, including heritage. So heritage is often forgotten about in environmental planning. It's not often not given enough weight in the planning policies that um, planning administrations prepare. In my experience as an urban planner, I'm an architect as well, but as an urban planner working in a city, a city of Sydney framework, I've seen uh, repeatedly that heritage is often overlooked when urban development policies are proposed. And so it needs to be um, constantly, people need to be constantly reminded of this. And again, that should occur through community consultation. And often there is debate about conflicting values. So, you know, development versus heritage conservation is, is a typical debate uh, at the city level. Um, but that debate needs to occur. Um, and we need to have policies for sustainable tourism. Uh, again, this is Georgetown, uh, a view from the air and the view from the water, which is regarded as being very important. And you can see the presence of um, the uh, luxury cruisers, um, which are coming because of the World Heritage Listing. Um, and we know from cities such as Valletta, when we've visited previously, how the, um, the influx of mass tourism affects local traffic, which in turn affects local communities. They can't move around their, old, their own cities. So Georgetown has taken the step to identify um, traffic circulation having regard to uh, the influx of tourists, including the introduction of um, buses, free hop-on, hop-on buses. And in their plan, they've identified the bus routes uh, through the city um, that will facilitate both heritage protection and um, free movement for both tourists and um, the citizens. And there's one of the hop-on, hop-off buses um, that the city and in so doing reduce traffic congestion. It's still a congested city but um, it's, it's assisted by this system. Fourth step, um, once strategic planning has been done then the planning instruments can be prepared and one of, oh, I'll, I'll be five minutes. Um, and in Georgetown one of the things that's been prepared which I think is a very good plan is their special area plan which provides the detail um, policies and controls for what should and should not happen in the place in order to protect heritage values. And it includes things such as the um, activity zoning diagram for the different land uses, but also it, it identifies more in more detail the, la the landmarks and the views and vistas that I spoke about before, and also provides um, height controls and policies for how to integrate new development so it doesn't dominate the existing development because that's one of the major issues for cities is that new development generally wants to dominate the scale of historic cities. So um, the controls in Georgetown are quite um, tight in relation to that. They advocate that new development should be no higher than adjacent development. Um, fifthly, um, once we've got policies, we need to manage effectively. So that's both by the administration, but the politicians as well. We need to manage in accordance with the planning controls and the guidelines, otherwise um, heritage values will be affected and, and not appropriately protected. 
one of the things that is required in Georgetown and indeed in many other cities is heritage impact assessment. So before any development is approved, if it may affect heritage values in any way, a heritage impact statement is required. Um, and you can imagine um, that uh, tall development um, in long streetscapes with, with long views down the streets would be affected even by development, taller development, even at a long distance away. You can see because of these long vistas that uh, taller development would impact on the streetscape and the townscape. Um, and um, issues such as um, facade retention and overbuilding are um, hopefully development that occurred in the past and won't occur in the future because this type of development certainly affects the townscape and heritage values generally. And Alvaro also mentioned the importance of um, um, maintenance and monitoring and uh, certainly that is advocated in the Hull approach as well and um, also appropriate conservation works. And finally um, is the coordination of activities. Um, and, and the administrations can actually work to coordinate the activities. In Georgetown, um, they did this again through community consultation as to what um, placemaking should occur. How can we make the city a better place through placemaking, through landscape projects, urban renewal projects uh, in, the, in the public realm? And there was agreement reached on that. And then the city partnered with a um, semi-government agency to actually carry out the works. But the works that were envisaged, such as new parks and um, streetscape, streetscape improvements and urban realm improvements, were all documented in the special area plan following agreement with the community. And finally, um, and, and this is one that I always stress, is the importance of interpretation making the values of the place known to um, everyone, and in particular the community, so that they understand the heritage values of the place, and tourists understand the heritage value of the place, uh, and everyone, developers understand the heritage values of the place, so that they can, if they do understand, there's more likelihood that they'll be better protected. In this case, these um, brochures were prepared by NGOs, non-government organisations, working in partnership with the World Heritage Office um, in Georgetown. So they're the, the six steps, and, and I suppose in summary what I'd say is I think we as CIVI can work towards implementing these six steps and picking out the important aspects for inclusion in the updated Valletta principles along with more detailed policies related to climate change and the SDGs. So thank you. Thank Fine you, David. Yes, finally, uh, tomorrow I'll talk about um, Sydney, where the next General Assembly will occur. <laughs> um, I would like to invite uh, Professor Nuran Gelsoy from Istanbul for the next presentation uh, concerning the transformation of the historic urban landscape of Istanbul, grey squares along the Bosphorus. It is a fascinating yeah. topic. Is literature. The importance of historic urban open public spaces have been raising as uh, one of the critical issues in urban planning and design under the title of the historic urban landscape. Urban open public spaces have come under the threat in an era of postmodernism in which everyday urban public life is altered both socially and culturally under the shadow of accelerating economic and technological change. This is one of the Bosphorus uh, quite square called Beylerbeyi. Public open spaces have been a significant component of cities for centuries and have also become a vital issue for design professionals and researchers. Containing layers of 
personal and collective memories in their dynamic social, spatial, and political meanings, historic urban public spaces are the reflections of cultures that generated, reformed, or transformed them. Considering the importance and the location in the country, Bosphorus, which makes Istanbul one of the most important transportation hubs of the world, defines the border between Europe and Asia, also the Black Sea and the Marmara Sea, and only exists to the Black Sea Basin. This is Bosphorus, this is Turkey, Istanbul, and the Bosphorus. 33 kilometers long, the Bosphorus is a major waterway within a natural valley composed of plateaus ranging in height from 120 to 200 meters. As a crossing, its location has always being important, however, the step valley allowed only sea transportation along its length in the times before the coastal areas were settled. Strategic location at the entrance of the Bosphorus, Istanbul Peninsula has been the capital of the three empires, East Roman, Byzantine, and Ottoman, and has been a significant trading, industrial, cultural, and political center uh, throughout its history. During the Ottoman times, the Quai squares were neighborhood centers where the passengers were welcomed and gathered to enter the Quai building surrounded by local bazaars, shops, coffee houses, and a mosque. Quai squares, uh, not only the transportation uh, uh, purposes, but also a very important gathering place for the local people. In other words, these squares were living spaces of the Bosphorus where the social life was focalized. Here, some views from the history the Bosphorus and Kwai, you probably can see here some uh, Kwai squares. This is old Kwai of Üsküdar from 19th century. This is Çengelköy and it was a gathering place, maybe some gathering here. Another one, uh, old Kwai of Anadolu Kava. In this study, it is aimed to reveal both functional and spatial transformation process of the Kwai squares, which play an important role in the sea transportation of Istanbul once, yet lost their main functions and original spatial organizations over time. In this respect, all of the 21 Kwai squares within Bosphorus Conservation Site were visited and uh, researched both in the urban and historical context methodology. Each square was analyzed in detail through observation, photographic documentation, and mapping in order to reveal their functional and spatial transformation. In the mapping phase of the study, aerial photos from 1966 and 2015 have been used. However, aerial photos from 1982 also have been used when there is no data of 1966. Here, we can see the Kwai squares of Anatolian side and also European side. Here you can see the Bosphorus. 
Each square has been revived within the following framework in order to reveal their function and spatial conditions, ownership and functionality, spatial organization and connections. Within this framework, in order to reveal the change of ownership and function, the chi-squares, the current uses, the presence and frequency of domestic ferry trips have been investigated as the next step in order to reveal the change in spatial organization and connections, the locations and forms of the quiet squares have been mapped and compared on earliest and most recent aerial photos, as I told you, 1966 and 2015. As a result, all the quiet squares have been analyzed and classified two main groups as conserved and transformed. Transformed squares have been also discussed into subgroups as uh, privatized and demolished. Unfortunately, we will see most of them have been lost. Firstly, the sea transportation functionality of the quays was, investi uh, quays was were, uh, investigated uh, where the sea transportation services have stopped, the squares no longer exist as a daily part of local life and community centers as road transportation has taken over, creating different living patterns. Thus, the existence of voyage, voyage as running routes has been analyzed. Here you can see the transportation uh, between the quays. There is no voyage from and to three quays, Rumeli Hisarı, Yeniköy, and Büyükdere, already closed down. These squares have been obtained via privatization tenders. On the other hand, and other uh, findings, the frequency of daily ferry trips between 1946 and today shows a drastic and continuous decrease in the number of trips and so the sea passengers along the Bosphorus. Here we can see, maybe you cannot read, 1946 there was uh, uh, 48 trips, but in 1994 uh, it was nine and nowadays it is six, continuously decreasing. Secondly, by questioning the accessibility and connections of the quiet squares, it has been determined that due to the development of coastal road system, five quiet squares, Arnavutköy, Emirgan, İstinye, Kuzguncuk, and Çubuklu, have lost the characteristics of livable Bosphorus squares due to the current lack of special relationship with their neighborhoods, they have remained only as quays. From this analysis, it is determined that there are no voyage, voyage or uh, to from Rumeli Hisarı, Yeniköy and Büyükdere. Only the old Büyükdere Quay building remained and after 28 years of inactivity, it is rented out for 36 years in 2013 and turned into a restaurant. Similarly, the new Rumeli Hisarı Quay building was transformed into a restaurant in 2012. Although there is no current information available for the new Yeniköy Kuai building, but uh, we heard that it is also going to be a restaurant. Here we can see the 1966 map and current map, the changing functions and the whole area uh, turned to uh, touristic facilities and these are also turned to restaurant. These are the buildings. P 
peers. Secondly, by questioning the accessibility and connections of the quai squares, it has been determined that due to the development of coastal road system, five uh, quai squares have lost the characteristics of livable Bosphorus squares due to the current lack of spatial relationship with their neighborhoods. Here you can see the Arnavut Köy, the new Emirgan. As further step, the original shape and location of these squares were analyzed. In this regard, uh, some uh, quite buildings changed the place, moved to another place. Here you can also see the different places from 1966 and 2016. By comparing the oldest and current images, it is clear that both of these squares have been moved and redeveloped. As a result of the survey, 11 quai squares have been partly conserved. These quais still welcome users as a gate to their neighborhoods and still serve the needs of sea transportation. Here you can see not the all, but partly. Some views from here in this map, you will see uh, privatized squares demolished and preserved. In parallel and beyond the contemporary global threats to the existence and production of traditional public spaces, the quai squares along the Bosphorus have also been faced with losing their cultural, natural, and spatial assets due to both their desirable locations and the increasing appetite for privatization. Coming to the uh, historic urban landscape, this is one of the elements of historic urban landscape of Bosphorus. The historic urban landscape is the urban area understood as the result of a historic layering of cultural and natural values and attributes extending beyond the notion of historic center or ensemble to include the broader urban context and its geographical setting. Coming to the conclusion, due to its unique geographical location, Istanbul has always been a maritime city and the Bosphorus has always been its most significant formation. Furthermore, the Bosphorus and the settlements with their unique quai squares along both of its sides have been the most important elements in the creation of the spectacular historic urban landscape of the city. This is a palace inherited from Ottoman. According to Bosphorus has been under the political and speculative pressures and has become a region where there has been a rush to damage the natural, cultural, and historical asset. Instead of quite squares, now we have three bridges. This is the first bridge. And after bridge, you will see the development of the just behind the Bosphorus. And this is new road, just built in front of the historic buildings in Arnavutköy. This is the view uh, in 1960s. This way, built in front of, there are some sea parts, and there are some. Before that, uh, these buildings, we call it yellow, just on the water, but you will see the uh, cars here. Here, this is the way. Consequently, quite squares, which have been very unique form of 
open public spaces and neighborhood centers of the Bosphorus, Istanbul are also facing with losing their cultural, historical, and spatial assets due to their desirable locations and increasingly appetite for privatization. And this is the last and third bridge. The important question is sustaining embed meanings, cultural, historical, and social, and providing a democratic platform for free speech, face-to-face -face communication for everybody, including the locals, visitors, and tourists, thus social awareness and integration, which would be of much more value than any tangible short-time benefits. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Nuran, for the um, for this the to enrich this discussion with uh, the exam uh, the example of Istanbul, which is one of the most important cities in the world, very rich in culture. So uh, the proposal from uh, FICA is to interrupt here uh, for a coffee uh, very fast and to continue and uh, to put uh, the discussion for both uh, sessions on the end in order to, to catch the time, okay? Um, 15 minutes and after that we have two um, uh, presentations on uh, cultural heritage. Five. Alors, une quinzaine de minutes, about 15 minutes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Let me present uh, our work, uh, uh, which we do in uh, Prague, in the uh, Czech Republic, and uh, which is related uh, to the theme of uh, uh, heritage values and uh, its attributes and uh, mapping of uh, very complex uh, urban landscapes, uh, what we call uh, historic uh, towns and cities. At the beginning, let me explain uh, the Czech approach. There is a very long tradition in uh, territorial protection of urban settlements. Uh, we have about 600 protected uh, urban areas. Uh, half of them are towns. Uh, uh, where we distinguish so-called reservations or reserves and uh, zones which uh, have a, a, a little lower uh, degree of protection. And then uh, other specific archaeological, technical ensembles and landscapes. So far the official authorities did not adopt any uh, specific uh, legislation uh, which would uh, take into account the concept of uh, historic urban landscape. It was previously today several times mentioned that uh, this concept is uh, rather different from the concept of uh, the protection of a uh, historic town as an uh, ensemble of precious uh, individual monuments that today the understanding is uh, more holistic and uh, includes of course uh, uh, other layers uh, than cultural heritage, uh, such as uh, natural heritage, uh, uh, the uh, natural setting, uh, social and uh, other uh, aspects of uh, cities. Uh, we uh, are running uh, a five-year uh, research project, uh, which is called Origin, Origin and Attributes of Heritage Values of Czech Historic Cities, where in um, conformity with uh, HUL uh, concept, uh, our work is based on researching the complex layering of urban settlements 
taking into account also not so evident uh, urban features uh, such as uh, the city uh, foundation or location traces and uh, connections uh, between the historic center and the whole uh, city uh, or uh, phenomena uh, which uh, seem to be out of the scope of urban heritage preservation. In our work, uh, we tried uh, to uh, somehow categorize the phenomenon in uh, cities, um, both tangible and intangible, such as our networks of uh, lines, uh, places, uh, routes, uh, or uh, other borders or uh, lines within the cities, uh, the aerial, uh, information or, or uh, uh, data such as uh, individual districts, cores, public places, blocks of houses, uh, and so on. The volume uh, of uh, uh, elements and uh, of course the activities, uh, individual activities of uh, groups of citizen, public, uh, etc. The attributes uh, or character defining elements such as topography, the location, position and orientation of uh, uh, phenomenon, morphology, the geometry, size and density, typology such as form, status or role, use in the city, and uh, the history, its uh, origin, age, development and authenticity authenticity of individual uh, features. Relations such as proportion, scale, connection, and uh, current state. We designed a method uh, which uh, has uh, uh, four pillars or four uh, different layers. The first is basic set of maps in GIS uh, uh, environment. It's uh, three by three maps, I will show you uh, later. The, from this set of maps, we are able to generate uh, specific maps, uh, which are uh, oriented uh, on uh, various uh, attributes or phenomena. And um, to analyze uh, these maps, we use uh, specific methods, uh, such as the analysis of uh, uh, history uh, of uh, urban development, the analysis of original uh, pattern of the city, uh, various uh, uh, analysis of image, uh, townscape, panorama or roofscape. Uh, we use also space syntax uh, method, social and uh, demographic uh, tools uh, where we try to uh, describe number changes uh, and use of units uh, within the historic center. And uh, last but not least, also qualitative questionnaires, both professional and uh, um, asking inhabitants. And finally, the fourth uh, layer uh, should be evaluation. Evaluation uh, for uh, ad hoc, uh, ad hoc assessment uh, for preparation of uh, um, uh, strategic uh, plans and for, uh, uh, for um, also monitoring purposes. This is the set of maps. Uh, uh, we are uh, monitoring three periods, 1850, that's uh, the oldest common mapping which uh, uh, we have uh, available in uh, uh, Austrian Empire. Uh, 1950, uh, when the modern city was constituted and uh, today's present state when the city is uh, uh, um, crossing its borders and is uh, uh, in fact matching with the surrounding landscape. Uh, and we use three scales, the scale 1 to 15,000 for the uh, landscape, 1 to 5,000 for uh, the entire urban area and 1 to 2,000 for the city uh, core. Uh, 
just few examples uh, how uh, th this uh, mapping looks. First is uh, the comparison of roads and uh, uh, streets, uh, the comparison bo at the bottom of uh, uh, urbanized area of the entire city. This is an example of České Budějovice, city close to Český Krumlov, you might know. The comparison of the development of uh, public spaces and uh, below uh, blocks uh, of uh, city blocks. On uh, the scale of the center, uh, it's uh, the city blocks, for example, and at the bottom, quite interesting, uh, the number of uh, entrances uh, in the blocks uh, uh, where we can uh, assess the the um, livability of uh, uh, individual streets. Uh, from this uh, basic uh, set of maps, we are uh, able to generate uh, the specific maps. Here, for example, uh, the color of uh, houses is uh, according to its uh, size. The small ones are dark, the bigger houses are uh, light in light gray. Sorry for this. Uh, uh, it's uh, just um, an example <clears throat> when we try to link the data of the houses on the public uh, spaces. So, for, ex for example, uh, top uh, center image is showing uh, number of shops uh, in uh, uh, those uh, blocks which uh, uh, we can use for uh, evaluating the, um, the, the life and capacity of, uh, of those uh, public spaces, uh, in this case the uh, square and uh, surrounding streets of uh, another uh, historic city of Pelhřimov. We are able to uh, study the uh, differences the cha uh, in uh, uh, changes. Uh, at the bo left bottom, uh, for instance, uh, you see the change uh, in uh, the amount of blocks and public spaces in uh, various uh, uh, representations. Here it's more in detail. And some examples of uh, specific uh, tools. Uh, this one uh, is uh, for uh, trying to uh, interpret uh, the uh, location of cities in 13th century in our country, similar uh, to the rest of Europe, were founded uh, tens of cities on a, a relatively regular plan. And this is, the, in fact, the basic uh, identity or uh, uh, DNA of uh, today's city, another tool to uh, compare the uh, views of uh, historic town of Pelhřimov. And this is just an example of the method how to uh, notice uh, the information from uh, the questionnaires. Uh, I promise to say a few words also uh, uh, in relation to uh, World Heritage. Uh, Prague, uh, uh, World Heritage City, found, uh, listed in 1992, uh, is, uh, has at the moment one and a half uh, million inhabitants and uh, about eight million visitors this year. Uh, but of course, the high pressure uh, uh, there is uh, related to the uh, volumetric changes of the city center and uh, also uh, of the uh, cityscape uh, where uh, the enormous pressure of uh, private investors uh, is uh, to, to change the uh, height of build, uh, buildings in Prague. Of course, uh, the tourism, uh, but from the citizen point of view, it's the tourism which is most disturbing uh, 
uh, phenomenon in the city. And it's not just the irritation, it's also uh, representing the fact that some streets are simply uh, doesn't, uh, don't have the capacity to, uh, to accept uh, all these uh, citizens. In uh, small uh, towns like Telč, the situation is uh, different. Uh, there is only uh, 5,000 inhabitants and about, uh, about 100,000 visitors per year. Telč was uh, also listed in 1992, so 27 years ago. But uh, some of the long-term effects we are uh, able to see only uh, these years. Uh, contrary to, to the Prague in Telč, uh, I personally believe that it's maybe the city itself uh, which is trying to uh, do the development which is not always uh, appropriate uh, and compatible with uh, cultural heritage and uh, outstanding uh, universal value. And uh, also trying to, um, um, trying to use the public space uh, of the main square uh, of the marketplace as a scene, uh, as a theater scene for various events. Uh, and this uh, um, ambition uh, is uh, not uh, always uh, conform uh, for uh, local uh, people uh, and uh, on the top uh, of that uh, in fact they have no representation in the city council so it's very difficult for uh, the inhabitants of the square uh, to uh, promote their, uh, their ideas and uh, uh, demands. To conclude, uh, uh, I would like to mention uh, that uh, the recognition of uh, outstanding universal value and listing of historic cities as world heritage is a great opportunity, but uh, also a big challenge, and uh, for some it could be uh, I would say, uh, excuse me, deadly kiss. Uh, because uh, uh, when uh, the site is not prepared and this could not be evaluated through the existence of management plan um, or tourism strategy, um, it, the reality is always uh, different and it does not uh, um, lay only on the local uh, situation. Uh, there are uh, pressures uh, both from private but also public sides. The ambition to attract more tourists uh, on the regional level, for example, or uh, local. Uh, and uh, in any case, uh, uh, the designation has an impact on quality of life of local community. What was once uh, silent, uh, quiet, uh, uh, neighborhood becomes a uh, shop front uh, with uh, many uh, uh, people who don't uh, understand and who, who don't uh, want to spend too much time in your uh, town or uh, neighborhood. I believe that uh, there is a need for good management practices and activity on local uh, administration level. In fact, it's the local admin administration who is taking the responsibility of the uh, state party that uh, uh, the state will take care of uh, the outstanding universal uh, value. Uh, the listing uh, definitely has an impact on the identity uh, of, the, of the place. Uh, uh, we witness uh, the change uh, in the uh, variety of shops, uh, in the variety of uh, offer uh, in uh, restaurants. We, uh, we have kebab, pizza, we have hamburger, but uh, on Telic Square it's impossible to have a soup or local dish. And uh, in this respect, I believe uh, that mass tourism in today's form is not sustainable and that at the end, it's not bringing uh, only positive benefits to local communities and uh, it's very difficult
to uh, manage tourism uh, in the view of long-term uh, safeguarding of cultural heritage. And it's a question or uh, I would like to open the discussion uh, if there are uh, probably some regulative measures or monitoring or corrective actions which could uh, um, prevent uh, what was described. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for keeping the time, and your suggestion is welcome, and perhaps we can discuss it later on. But now we have to uh, proceed and to listen to something much nearer geographically uh, to us. It's about Carthage, by Si Abdelmeji de Nabili. Erjouk and Tatafadda. Ah oui. Et j'avais peut-être une barbe. Ah. Derrière nous, et je compléterai ma communication en donnant quelques explications à partir de, ce, de cette photo. Depuis le déroulement de la campagne de fouilles internationales dans le site de Carthage, qui a été lancée par le directeur général René Maheu à l'époque, une campagne, cette campagne s'est déroulée de 1973 à 1992 et l'inscription du site sur la liste du patrimoine mondial par l'UNESCO en 1979, la seule action fondamentale qui a été faite en Tunisie a été la promulgation du décret 85-1246 du 7 octobre 1985 relatif au classement du site de Carthage. Sur la base du code du patrimoine archéologique, historique et des arts traditionnels qui a été promulgué par la loi du 24 février 1994 et notamment les articles 3, 6 et 7, a été publié l'arrêté des ministres de la culture et de l'équipement et de l'habitat du 4 septembre 1996, portant création et délimitation du site culturel de Carthage, publié dans le journal officiel du 13 septembre 1996. Cet arrêté prescrit à l'article 3 qui dit « Conformément aux dispositions » de l'article 8 du Code du patrimoine archéologique, historique et des arts traditionnels sus visés, les services compétents du ministère de la Culture sont chargés de l'élaboration du plan de protection et de mise en valeur, appelé PPMV, du site culturel de Carthage, Sidi Boussaïd, tel que créé et délimité par le présent arrêté. Cependant, cette procédure a été bloquée par l'ancien président de la République. Il, en a, il a procédé par décret du 2416 du 4 septembre 2006 et par un autre décret numéro 968 du 17 avril 2007 au déclassement de trois grands terrains classés par la loi pour servir à un projet de spéculation foncière et immobilière. Cette prédation faite au patrimoine national a été dénoncée à l'UNESCO en temps voulu. Le 14 janvier 2011, 
éclate la révolution. Le régime Ben Ali s'effondre. Aussitôt, une pétition est diffusée auprès de l'opinion internationale et nationale dénonçant le, son, le scandale du lotissement et demandant deux choses, l'arrêt de la construction de ce lotissement et la promulgation du plan de protection et de mise en valeur. Dès mars 2011, un décret-loi numéro 11 du 20 mars 2011 relatif au parc archéologique de Carthage abroge les déclassements faits au détriment du parc. Depuis cette date, la société civile n'a cessé d'intervenir pour que le plan de protection et de mise en valeur de Carthage soit promulgué. Déjà six ministres de la Culture se sont succédés à la tête de ce département sans que progresse ce dossier. Tous ces ministres ont été informés de l'importance du site de Carthage et surtout des engagements de l'État tunisien envers l'UNESCO qui a inscrit ce site sur la liste du patrimoine mondial et a porté son concours constamment. Entre-temps, le site n'a cessé de subir des dégradations, des prédations, des spéculations. À plusieurs reprises, l'UNESCO a attiré l'attention de l'État tunisien sur ces dangers, en particulier à l'occasion de la 42e session tenue le 24, du 24 juin au 4 juillet 2018 où figure une importante décision numéro 42 comme 7B60 adoptée par le comité du patrimoine mondial qui demande en particulier d'adopter et de mettre en œuvre le plan de protection et de mise en valeur des biens. La situation continuant de se dégrader dans le site. L'UNESCO a délégué du 28 au 26 avril 2019, c'est-à-dire cette année, un haut responsable pour une visite sur les lieux et une prise de contact avec les responsables tunisiens. Lors de la 43e session du comité du patrimoine national qui a eu lieu du 30 juin au 10 juillet 2019. Ce comité a de nouveau examiné la situation critique du site de Carthage. Ces remarques figurent dans le rapport de la session au paragraphe 55 intitulé « Site archéologique de Carthage, Tunisie » E37, page 61-63. En particulier, il signale que le site risque d'être inscrit sur la liste du patrimoine mondial en péril. Il insiste aussi pour que le PPMV, le plan de protection et de mise en valeur, soit adopté. Rien n'a été fait et l'actuel gouvernement achève son mandat sans avoir entrepris aucune action, ni pris aucune décision, alors que le site abandonné à lui-même ne cesse de se dégrader. Outre l'association des Amis de Carthage, de la société civile, qui n'a cessé d'alerter les responsables de prendre les mesures qui s'imposent, plusieurs personnalités universitaires ou culturelles ont intervenu par des articles lanceurs d'alerte sur le risque que le site de Carthage sorte de la liste du patrimoine mondial si les autorités ne prenaient pas les mesures législatives qui s'imposent. De même, un amateur de culture, M. Boubacar Ben Kraim, a publié dans la presse en 2015 une lettre ouverte au ministre de la Culture et du Tourisme. D'autre part, les trois associations de la société civile, les Amis de Carthage, les Riverains de Carthage et les Amis de la Malga ont publié dans la presse du 16 octobre 2014, dans une tribune libre, un plaidoyer pour Carthage. Je rappelle, le 3 décembre 2014, un colloque s'est tenu à Gamart, ayant pour objet 
organisé par l'Institut d'archéologie du patrimoine, ayant pour sujet le site culturel de Carthage, patrimoine partagé. Les actes de ce colloque ont été publiés. Ils abordent l'ensemble des problèmes du site de Carthage. Vous comprendrez pourquoi je n'ai pas développé plus, parce qu'on n'a pas fait grand-chose sur le site de Carthage, contrairement à toutes les autres équipes. Et je me tourne maintenant vers ce plan. Vous voyez le site. C'est une photo tirée de Google il y a un ou deux ans. Elle date de 2015. Et vous voyez, au moment où le site a été classé, c'est-à-dire en 1979, tout cet arrière-pays était nu. C'était un terrain agricole. Vous voyez que tout a été construit, même là où les, les, les berges du lac qui se trouvent à gauche ont, sont totalement construites. Les terrains agricoles de la Marsa ont été entièrement construits. La seule tâche verte qui existe, elle est verte parce qu'elle est encore agricole, parce que ça a été la zone classée. Et vous voyez cette zone-là, c'est celle qui a été classée et qui devait faire l'objet d'un plan de protection et de mise à l'heure, c'est-à-dire l'étude des pa des, du parc, des plans, des paysages, etc. C'est la même, mais un peu, plus, un peu plus grande. Vous voyez, cette zone, c'est à peu près 300 hectares qui sont grignotés de partout, vous voyez, et qui doivent constituer ce parc historique archéologique et naturel, vous voyez. Voilà la zone, la zone telle qu'elle devait être, euh, telle que elle devait être distribuée, c'est-à-dire en secteur, avec un secteur jaune qui était proprement archéologique pour les fouilles, la zone verte qui devait être un parc vert naturel, et vous voyez, on englobait aussi. Les, la montagne, les monts de le, le Cap Sidi Bou Saïd. Voyez Et ce plan, de, ce plan devait être, ce plan d'aménagement devait être sur ce plan de classement, vous voyez, qui a été publié en 1985 et sur lequel tous les gouvernements butent aujourd'hui. Pourquoi Parce qu'ils veulent le ramener à la construction. C'est-à-dire l'archéologie et le patrimoine aura travaillé pour les spéculateurs et la corruption. Voilà, je vous remercie. Je suis, je suis prêt à vous répondre si vous avez des questions. D'accord. J'appelle les quatre derniers intervenants. Si Abdelmajid est déjà là, euh, Martin, Olsou, euh, Zoran, et. Uh, Where is David? Yes, David. Okay, I understand the situation must be extremely difficult for you because we have very different presentation together. Some of them are linked to particular sites like Istanbul, like uh, Carthage. Uh, we have others which are series like 
uh, villages. And uh, we have in, uh, a presentation of some uh, processes like uh, historical urban landscapes and also the effect of uh, uh, World Heritage List on uh, the uh, rapid development of tourism and its impact on World Heritage sites. So the choice is yours. Please ask your questions. Um, hello. Um, English or French? Uh, what do you prefer? English, French? Well, what? No? Whatever. Um, my question is for uh, Mr. Nebli. Uh, French? Uh, English? Uh, um, if by chance uh, one day a government would. Français. Ok. Si par un heureux hasard, un jour un gouvernement tient le euh, projet de reprend le projet de sauvegarde de, du site de Carthage en main et qui décide vraiment de faire une action, est-ce que des démolitions sont envisageables Tout le site qui a été reconstruit, est-ce qu'on peut démolir ou pas qui prend la décision de faire publier le plan de protection et de mise à l'heure. Donc, on, euh, ouais. bon, donc on, en fait, on est dans un état de sauvegarder ce qu'on qu peut euh, sauvegarder en ce moment. Ça. Vous savez que les problèmes, les problèmes fonciers et les problèmes immobiliers sont des problèmes politiques. Ouais. Donc euh, l'argent est plus fort en fait. Une autre question, Paolo. I have a question to the Czech colleague. After con uh, congratulations for a very good methodology they made really of the study. He was uh, talking in the end of what this morning I was putting like the big dangers of the mass tourism. And today uh, they call cultural tourism is part of the mass tourism. Because they call it, they so call it art cities like Prague, Flores, Marrakech. We were yesterday, let's not talk about Barcelona because we have other problems at the moment. But what are the measures that the Czechs authorities or institutions like them they have to try to mitigate these terrible effects that we saw in the photos that we all know. Because uh, the analysis is perfect. Now the proposal is the most difficult part, and each one is trying to learn from the others what we can do. In Venice, it has been quite easy, because being an island, we've been putting entrance, like in the metro, and when it's full, no one is coming in. In the other cities, we can stop coaches, but we can't avoid people to arrive. What is the Czech uh, Academy position on this site, especially regarding Prague City, that is facing exactly what you're saying, changing of restaurants, changing of shops, changing of that. In our opinion, the only fight, but it's a long-term fight, is that local inhabitants, they understand what they are having and what they're losing. And then making a SWOT analysis to make understand the authorities that also economically, in long term, this is not convenient. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, question. Uh, in Prague, the situation is m maybe more difficult because uh, we have 27 municipal districts and plus uh, the uh, uh, city Council of Prague and the historic center is managed by Prague 1, Prague 2, partly Prague uh, 5 
and maybe three, and then the, the city council. Uh, and uh, um, regarding the shops and um, uh, houses to, to rent, uh, it's mainly Prague One who owns the, the buildings and they have, they, ha they have the possibility to regulate uh, this, uh, not, to, not to rent it for uh, bad quality tourist uh, shops and so on. So that's uh, this uh, thing, and uh, unfortunately in Prague, uh, we are uh, since 2008 we don't have a management plan. We had three versions uh, of a working document, but it was not approved yet. Uh, so, in fact, the management of uh, flows of tourism, uh, tourists, or um, we. Uh, does not exist uh, in very effective way and we, uh, we uh, are not able to manage uh, congestion uh, of uh, tourists uh, in many places, such as Charles Bridge. And of course the mass tourism is bringing also effects on physical state of the monuments because there is a vandalism, uh, deterioration. We, we had graffiti on Charles Bridge a few months ago uh, by, done by the uh, foreign uh, tourists. So, um, the response is the, um, of, it, I agree that, there is, uh, that uh, actions must be uh, done, but uh, it's still not, um, it's not, uh, there is not a single agreement uh, between all the actors. Thank you. Oui, de même nous avons la réunion générale de, du CIVI. Et j'imagine, comme d'autres fois, on aura une déclaration sur les sites de Carthage. La question en appuyant ce que nous avons entendu, mais je voudrais que nous soyons eh, clairs dans le sens de qu'on demande une chose qui est déjà fait ou qu'il faut la faire, moi je l'ai bien compris, le plan, c'est déjà fait, il faut l'approuver ou il faut le, le faire. Oui. Première chose. Et deuxième chose, s'il y a quelque chose que vous nous dites maintenant qui puisse appuyer sans donner tellement de raisonnements comme des dates, comme vous avez dit, mais un peu, qui qu ne soit pas seulement un appui eh, aveugle, mais un appui raisonnable et légèrement documenté. Et je pense que nous devrions être en contact avec vous eh, pas, pour, pour le faire bien à, à la session de demain matin. Oui, je vous remercie. Okay. Le, plan, le plan de protection et de mise à l'heure est prêt depuis 1993 et il avait été approuvé par l'ancien président. Il avait été approuvé. C'est pourquoi il a permis de faire paraître l'arrêté de création de délimitation que je citais. C'est après, quand on a dû passer à l'exécution et à la promulgation du plan de protection, que ses conseillers lui ont dit, au lieu de faire un parc national, c'est préférable et plus et meilleur pour eux de faire de la spéculation foncière. Et il en a payé le prix, puisque son, son projet n'est même pas achevé, qu'il a dû déguerpir, vous voyez. Et au lendemain de la Révolution, quand on a fait pression avec cette lettre nationale et internationale qui a été signée par l'ensemble des archéologues et des historiens. Le gouvernement, parce que c'était dans l'enthousiasme de la Révolution, a annulé tous les décrets de déclassement. Mais c'est après que les gouvernements qui sont venus après sont entrés dans l'impasse, non parce que certains n'en voulaient pas aussi parce qu'il y a aussi de l'argent sale qui circule et que tout ça fait une pression sur les ministres et sur les gouvernements et même sur les premiers ministres. Et c'est pourquoi chaque fois qu'on va, 
il vous dit, il n'y a pas que vous, mais on leur dit, c'est un plan de classement national et international. Et si Carthage est sur la liste du patrimoine mondial, c'est parce qu'on a sauvé ce site. Et l'article de classement dit qu'il faut aménager l'article 3 de ce décret de, déclassement, de, ce, de classement du site de 85 dit qu'il faut, dans des délais raisonnables, que cette terre qui est non édificante dit, archéologique, soit fouillée en partie et mise en valeur. Vous voyez Mais il n'y a pas une barque de zone pour le site de Carthage. Comment Il n'y a pas une barque de zone pour le site de Carthage. Euh, un, un, un zone tampon. <coughs> La zone de tampon. Le, la zone de tampon, qui est souvent évoquée par l'UNESCO, c'est une fausse piste. Pourquoi Parce qu'à Carthage, il y a deux choses distinctes. Il y a la zone archéologique qui est délimitée par la carte jaune. Elle est tout de suite après, tout de suite dans le voisinage du périmètre de la carte jaune qui est archéologique, il y a un plan d'aménagement urbain qui veille à la sauvegarde à, à, qui a un, un carnet, un, bulletin, enfin, comment on dit, un cahier des charges euh, urbain, urbain qui, dit, qui spécifie que la zone doit garder l'aspect de cité-jardin, que les lots doivent être, qui existent déjà doivent avoir au moins 800 mètres, qu'on ne doit construire en théorie que le quart, et que le niveau, euh, qui, les deux niveaux qui sont permis ne doivent pas dépasser les 7 mètres. Vous voyez Donc il y avait un programme, un, un, le plan d'aménagement urbain de Carthage pour la zone construite, qui est déjà construite, est très sévère, et il suffisait de le surveiller. Simplement, comme on a relâché, il y a eu des excès. C'est ça la zone tampon il n'y a pas besoin. La zone tampon, elle sait peut-être pour les zones forestières, pour les zones agricoles, mais là, on est entre une zone archéologique qui a été extraite de la zone, normalement, théoriquement, qui devait être construite. Parce que le site de Carthage était constructible jusqu'en 1968. C'est en 1968 que la Tunisie, qui est devenue indépendante, a pris conscience qu'un site pareil ne pouvait pas disparaître de la de, de, disparaître sous, sous le, le flot de l'urbanisation et qu'à ce moment-là, on a dit ce qui est construit continue de rester, mais on le surveille, on surveille le plan d'aménagement en hauteur, en densité et le reste interdit. Et c'est pourquoi Parce qu'en 1980, on a, en, dès 19, les années 70, on avait prévu que en, entre 1980 et 1990, tout serait construit, y compris cette zone archéologique. Et du reste, on est en 2000, 2019, vous voyez, et tout ce que vous avez vu comme lotissement et comme lotissement, c'est ces 20 dernières années. Donc, euh, pendant ce temps-là, la construction s'est faite et maintenant, elle étrangle cet espace qui, pour la plupart des gens, est considéré comme un terrain en friche, c'est-à-dire un terrain qui n'est pas mis en valeur. Et pourquoi il n'est pas mis en valeur Parce qu'il n'y a pas le plan de protection, parce qu'il n'y a pas eu l'approbation du plan de protection et de mise à l'heure. Vous voyez Et donc c'est ça, c'est ce qu'on demande actuellement, c'est une décision politique, parce qu'il n'y a que le politique qui peut décider de la... Techniquement, le, le plan existe, mais c'est la volonté politique qui manque. Et de, de ce côté-là, pour répondre à votre question, s'il y a une pression internationale, elle ne peut être que, que, que prise en compte. Pourquoi Parce que la Tunisie, elle vit avec un peu d'honneur sur cette liste du patrimoine mondial. Vous voyez Actuellement, on s'amuse à classer les sur la liste du patrimoine immatériel, la façon de la, les tapis en, en, en alpha. Vous voyez L'État tunisien s'occupe actuellement de, de classer sur la liste du patrimoine immatériel 
la façon dont les artisans font des tapis d'alpha. Il n'y a aucune relation avec le plan de la Médina de Tunis. Non, ils sont complémentaires. Ils sont complémentaires. Ce plan a été fait. Ce plan a été conçu. Il marche, le plan de la Médina. Il marche, plus ou moins. Enfin, enfin... Non, voilà. C'est un, un plan, le plan de sauvegarde du patrimoine a été conçu dans les années 60 et il devait avoir deux volets pour la Tunisie un volet Médina arabo-musulmane et l'histoire musulmane et un volet antique Carthage et avec Sidi Bou Saïd vous voyez et donc on avait toute l'histoire millénaire or nos gouvernements même pas, il y a même pas deux semaines le président de la République par intérim disait qu'on a qu'on est un pays qui a 3000 ans d'histoire. Il faut le prouver. Non, il n'y a pas. C'est récent alors. C'est récent. Mais c'est un, un pays qui a tendance à refuser son histoire, mais à l'exploiter à l'extérieur, à l'intérieur à l'international, et c'est pourquoi vous pouvez jouer un rôle. Euh, J'ai quelques questions pour euh, Madame Nouran. Est-ce que je peux parler en français Oui, oui, préfère, hein je préfère. Euh, D'accord. Donc, euh, c'est par rapport au euh, case quest En fait, euh, moi, je m'intéresse à l'architecture ottomane et je profite pour, euh, pour, pour vous poser euh, cette question. Ah, vous voulez en, en anglais D'accord. Euh, je vais être un peu bref parce que... What's the uh, historical uh, or uh, ancient function of uh, quay squares in the 19th century No uh, Quelle est la fonction d'origine de, de ces quay squares, de, de ces, uh, case squares in, uh, en 19e siècle L'origine des... De comment As uh, I showed the map, the um, uh, piers are the center of these little uh, fishermen villages. Uh, we, uh, uh, we constructed the, uh, it uh, in the 19th century or uh, before? No, before that. Okay. We As I told you, uh, Istanbul and uh, Uh, Bosphorus uh, has uh, many civilization, uh, Roman Empire, Byzantium, and also uh, Ottoman Empire, and now Turkish Republic. Hey, and uh, K squares uh, appartain, uh, it reminds uh, at uh, Ottoman uh, architecture? Yes. Okay. Yes. There are Ottoman architecture and also some uh, remains from Byzantine period and also Roman. Uh, thank you. The history of uh, Istanbul uh, goes back to 8,000 years ago. Okay, I would like to all, thank all the speakers this, uh, for this evening, all the interventions. Uh, I have... Um, Maybe um, uh, an idea or a submission, or an idea I would like to submit, is um, um, we talked before with uh, Mr. David about um, a mapping approach, and uh, we saw the example of Mr. Uh, Thomas. Um, <coughs> maybe the um, multi-layer entrance, as we, as we said before, multi-layer entrance, is um, a, a good approach because we need to produce uh, and to uh, um, uh, vary, uh, multi multiply the, the, um, 
the, um, the topics like uh, geomorphology, like hydrology, like uh, uh, urban history, uh, architectural history, evolutions. And uh, this observation is, um, is from a Tunisian architect that learned in a Tunisian uh, school of architecture. And we learned, and now I make the link with the Mr. Professor Abdmajid Nebli, we learned only here uh, about um, um, uh, Roman urbanism, and then uh, Arabic urbanism, and then uh, French urbanism. So we don't have uh, a succession of, uh, of uh, history of urban cities uh, here in, in, the, in the, the School of Tunisia. So, uh, the, the, my remark is backward and forward. Uh, that's why Professor Nebli said we need to, um, to uh, enhance the history of Tunisia. Valoriser l'histoire de la Tunisie. Uh, valoriser l'histoire de la Tunisie, c'est-à-dire um, uh, connaître les, les, les différentes entrées, les différents points d'entrée uh, uh, à partir du moment où on peut proposer à la population, aux experts, uh, des, une, une connaissance multi-entrée. Hein, urbanistique, histoire de l'évolution urbaine, histoire de l'évolution patrimoniale, histoire de l'évolution architecturale. On valorise aussi bien les experts, aussi bien la population, et le, le niveau de conscience s'élève. Aujourd'hui, on n'en est pas encore à ce, à ce niveau-là. C'est pour ça que je, je reviens à, aux interventions de M. David et de M. Thomas, qui, qui proposent un outil. Aujourd'hui, en Tunisie, on a des, des compétences d'architectes et d'urbanistes qui maîtrisent l'outil informatique, l'outil d'approche, et on peut, ça, ça, ça peut être une entrée en matière pour proposer ces multi-layers, hein, des calques, des calques uh, layers of uh, traditional foods, uh, traditional uh, evolution, urban evolution, uh, architectural evolution, and then we can build a, a different storyteller, storytelling, and then when the, the visitor came here in Carthage or Sousse or he can uh, choose uh, uh, storytelling about food, storytelling about uh, social uh, evolutions, and, uh, and now we are not in this uh, step here. Je ne sais pas, excusez-moi, professeur. C'est ce qu'il faudrait, parce que ça va intéresser. Par exemple, le palais de Mohamdi. Qu'est-ce que je vais faire, moi, là-bas, au palais de Mohamdi Etc. Pour rapporter à ce que vous dites, je suis tout à fait d'accord. Est-ce que vous trouvez normal Est-ce que vous trouvez normal qu'un musée national de Carthage, à Carthage, soit fermé, alors qu'il sert justement à la prise de conscience. Or, il est fermé. Thank you, Samir. Maybe my question, I have two questions. One toward Thomas, uh, I would like to ask you for the skyline analysis of these cities. The skyline analysis of Prague and the other cities. I think that one of them is mega structure, the other is smaller structure. Prague is a huge city now. What benefit we can have in these days, visual effect, on analyzing, for instance, the skyline line of Praga. Before that, in the history, we know that the small scale of the villages or the towns, the existence of these skylines or the, let me say, the uh, central elements in this skyline were important to study the balance, the alternation, and so on in the city. But wh what will help us in a city like Praga in this moment, do we need it or we can replace it with or connect it to some activities going in the city as the commercial activity, the touristic activity uh, or the developmental activity in the city concentrated there or there or somewhere else. But I think it's not a pure indicator about the general structure of the city for, uh, for the time being. I am wrong or right? The second question is toward our Turkish colleague. I know that these uh, squares, some of them were rebuilt or were reconstructed in the Turkish time after 1924. They are not pure Ottoman. Just, please, just to, to answer me. Thank you. 
This is the last question. No, no question anymore. And but he can answer. Yes, we, we, we have, we'll have two answers, but that was the last question. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not a specialist on a skyline, but uh, I, I think it always uh, <coughs> represented what, what is happening in the, in the city. If you were coming to the city, you understood where you are going. Today, it's not clear anymore. Uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, height of the building doesn't necessarily mean its uh, value or importance uh, from a social or uh, community point of view. And uh, at the moment in Prague, we are missing two documents. One is a master plan, which is proposing to have a grid with height regulation, a grid of two by 100 by 100 meters, and each uh, of the cell of this grid uh, has, for, for example, eight stories. So that means that you can build up uh, to eight stories there. There's a big discussion because this is proposed to, to be applied also on the historic center of Prague, which has another regulation thanks to its uh, um, designation as a uh, heritage uh, reservation. And, uh, and second document is the management plan, which has a different approach, which says the skyline is finished, Prague is a, a kind of a city which is in the landscape, well set, there are dominant churches, uh, towers, uh, and so on, and it should remain like this. And if you want to build a high-rise uh, buildings, uh, build it uh, out uh, of this so-called Prague basin. Yeah. And uh, there is not a, a political or um, agreement on this, and it will be a discussion. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, uh, in Prague, some politicians have the ambition to build high rise. Some people don't see it as a good uh, and uh, good approach, and we, we think it's a bit. Uh, we cannot beat other cities with high-rise buildings and there's no reason to build high-rise uh, buildings in Prague because Prague has other qualities. Yeah, in Prague, it's, um, uh, there's um, just... Uh, Actually, in the 90s, huh? especially in the last years, this structure, the high structure, we take a big respect for end floor, for end floor. Actually, this end floor is not enough to cover the cathedral of the mosques, and there are some other services. So, the need for such skyscrapers, Okay. Uh, But uh, there is a um, uh, massive uh, di discussion in Prague now. There was a um, uh, monitoring from UNESCO just uh, two months ago, and uh, before it was um, a meeting of experts, and they uh, talked about this, about his master plan and the management plan, and there is a uh, discussion uh, going on. But I would like now uh, to, to finish and uh, to close the sessions. Um, I'm really happy about uh, all the discussions to today. It worked out very well. And I think um, now we, we, uh, we ask um, FICA about what is going on uh, in the evening, if something is going uh, on or uh, if we will meet tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Nothing? Oh.
Okay, so um, free time for you. Have a nice dinner and uh, be uh, with us tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much. <laughs>